Welcome to the next in our series on Seamus Heaney. In this video, we're looking at Station Island. I should remind you that these are not my thoughts, but the analysis that my father has undertaken of a poet he admires and the perspective that he developed. The poet, of course, is Seamus Heaney, and the analysis is that of David Forbert OBE. It's his words that will follow. Station Island, published by Faber and Faber in September 1984, is Seamus Heaney's seventh collection. Heaney is in his mid-forties, husband and father of three children in secondary education. He makes his living as a poet. In the nine years since the life changes that accompanied a previous pivotal collection north of 1975, Heaney has risen to a host of challenges. On the income front, his employers at Dublin's Carisfoot College and Harvard University have both seen the value of a prestigious poet in residence and agreed contracts that do not overlap. Political events in Ulster have reached a new low. Imprisonment without trial, hunger strikes, a distant cousin the victim of random sectarian assassination. The IRA has murdered a member of the British royal family and mounted a successful gunpowder plot in Brighton in 1981, aimed at the British political establishment. In lighter vein, in 1983, to underline his Irishness, Heaney directed a satirical sideswipe at Penguin Books, for including him in an anthology of British poetry. Be advised my passport's green, no glass of ours was ever raised to toast the Queen. Heaney identified Station Island as his book of changes. The modes and manners of what had made his reputation were to be superseded by new and unexpected things. Heaney revealed what was going on in his head as he assembled Station Island. I needed to butt my way through a blockage, a pile of hampering stuff, everything that had gathered up inside me to have it out with myself, to clear the head if not the decks. One principal obstacle was the potency of his rigid Catholic upbringing, the undying tremor and draw of its language and practices that generated guilt feelings, inhibited enjoyment of the more liberal lifestyle he'd espoused and led him to question his faith. A second distressing issue was the cycle of murder and revenge perpetrated on the streets of Ulster on an almost daily basis. Others left him feeling culpable for not speaking out enough and for being too often absent from his home soil, busy in America or elsewhere. Station Island has three parts. The lyrics of the first part, based largely on personal rites of passage and experiences, hint that changes are afoot. Its early poems dismiss the sexual hang-ups generated by the repressive social attitudes of the 1950s and celebrate the sensual and magical aspects of his domestic setup. Chekhov's failed odyssey to the far east of Russia somehow reflects Heaney's inner feeling that he tries to do things right but falls short. This is a theme picked up again in the tale of the posturing but impotent activist in Sandstone Keepsake. The artefacts of shelf life tempt Heaney away from restrictive orthodoxy. The smooth charm of an American friend collides with Ireland's cultural backwardness in making strains. A group of poems to do with children spells out both the naive pleasures and potential pitfalls of existence. A bat on the road identifies a creature able to circumnavigate obstacles and fly free as nature dictates. The delightful miniature Widgeon introduces Heaney's first subtle voicing, Air blown into a dead bird's sound box in the hope of resuscitating its call will resemble his own voice sounding through Sweeney, the mythical birdman of the last section. In the final piece, King of the Ditchbacks, Sweeney stirs, transmitting a dark morse that will beat remorselessly through part three. Station Island's central section reworks a three-day expedition to Loch Derg, a Catholic pilgrimage site that Heaney undertook in his youth and brings the poet, now in his forties, face to face with his much younger self. Heaney composed the sequence, he says, as an examination of conscience rather than a confession. His aim is to put his old allegiances, hang-ups and frailties to the test. The young pilgrim follows the Stations of the Cross. At each step of the way, a shape materialises, passes on its message and then fades from view. He hears spirit voices from the past a religious hardliner who urges him to be unafraid of making himself unpopular. The shadow of a Catholic missionary who died in the Catholic Church's failed attempt to convert third world natives. These are the three shades, including his primary school head, 
who influenced his personal development. He recoils at the disfigured face of a shopkeeper murdered in cold blood by paramilitaries within earshot of his terrified wife. He meets archaeologist friend Tom Delaney, who died of tuberculosis in his early 30s and whose diggings unearthed military paraphernalia from Ireland's war-torn past. He hears reproving voices, the recalcitrant Celtic temperament of real-life Simon Sweeney, who excoriates him for going with the Catholic flow, the hunger striker who details the terminal effects of his fast, his murdered cousin rebuking him for whitewashing brutal events. There are emblematic images too, a simple trinket dedicated to a beloved girl who died young, a drinking mug still intact despite the ravages of time. No worship takes place. Heaney's version of a mystical 16th century poem suggests everything can be explained without God's intervention, and in an act bordering on sacrilege, Heaney abstains from worship to lose his virginity in a hidden spot on the island. The strongest advice is delivered by the ghost of James Joyce. Pulling your poetic punches serves no purpose, nor does stressing yourself about things. High time you opened your mouth and let fly. Why Joyce? For one simple reason, answered Heaney. The pilgrimage was for papists. Joyce is our chief consultant. Acknowledging the dark, joyless mood of part two, Heaney said he lightened up and got a bit of lift off in Sweeney Redivivus. The section centres around the figure of Sweeney, a 7th century Irish king, cursed by St Ronan, turned into a bird and exiled. Heaney had published his version of the myth, Sweeney Astray, in 1983. The sonic echo, Heaney, Sweeney, points to a twin contribution to a series of dramatic monologues. First gloss launches Heaney into change and revival mode. Then, to their mutual surprise, the poet joins the exiled Sweeney on the wing. They witness pre-D-Day preparations from a treetop in the 1940s. Just hanging on the breeze allows them to examine other ornithological families that cross their flight path. First flight describes their individual moment of transfiguration, Sweeney into a bird via a bishop's curse, Heaney into a new determination, having cleared away the hampering stuff dolloped on the roadway. As for what went before, a waking dream confirms that the Sweeney experience has changed everything, that old patterns will no longer work. Untangling the twine ball of his old existence takes Heaney a necessary stage further. In Illo Tempore, Heaney shakes his head in disbelief that the religious practices that shaped him as a youngster, that taught him to know his place, that have brainwashed him, could have endured so long. Henceforth, dishevelled observers in the branches may observe a woman bathing without guilt, yearning for things lost, a wife or a homeland is deserving of sympathy. He depicts the organised church as a trampling invasion that took over both Irish people and their land, comparing it unfavourably with the emblematic hermit figures of early Christianity, who chose seclusion compared with the dedicated monk scribes of the first millennium monasteries, whose copying of manuscripts carried the civilization safely through the Dark Ages. The master pays reverential tribute to an anonymous teacher living secluded in a medieval ruin, a giant against whom to measure himself. The painter Cézanne emerges as the grumpy, uncompromising advocate of direct action that Heaney would quite like to be. A lampoon of the social hierarchy imposed by Ireland's invaders acts as a powerful reminder of its predicament. Three political vignettes featuring iconic Irishmen of earlier times demonstrate that little or nothing has changed. It was a vixen's call that opened the way to the world he and Sweeney are looking down on, and Heaney uses holly, the prickly pagan symbol that has survived, as a Christmas decoration to link the two worlds. In the final collection, Heaney is on the road, on a journey to a destination of his own choosing, wearing the shoes of a man who has thrown off the shackles. If you are excited by the presentation and wish to unravel this dense, intense collection, you'll get all the help you deserve at 4 Thank you for listening. We'll see you there.